President Andrew Jackson used the Indian Removal Act to force southeastern Indian tribes to move to what's now Oklahoma in order to open up land for settlement. Particularly the Cherokee lands in North Georgia, where gold had recently been discovered. Now, not all the Native Americans left Appalachia, though, thanks to the man we're going to tell you about today. Hello, folks. I'm Steve Gilly, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories A History of Appalachia. Steve, we both grew up hearing the story of, well, for lack of a better term, the Trail of Tears, Mm -hmm. uh, the Cherokee leaving, being forced to leave and go west. And then we kind of got introduced to this about Andrew Jackson and a lot of people saying that Andrew Jackson was a terrible president and, and, you know, so many different things and how he hated the Indians and so forth like that. But you know, it's still, it's a, still a part of our history. And, you know, it's, it's one reason why a lot of the Indians are out West today because of this that took place. And it's sad, but, you know, we're about to learn about the good, the bad and the ugly, and, you know, some other things in between as to what really happened during that time. Well, Rod, this is actually two stories. Okay. The Cherokee oral tradition and later discovered documents that basically tell a little bit different story, Mm -hmm. as we'll tell you a little bit later on in this podcast. Okay. At the time of the Appalachian frontier in the late 1700s, one of the Cherokee war chiefs, Dragging Canoe, who we've told you about before, Mm -hmm. left the East Tennessee area and moved his followers, known as the Chickamauga, to the southwest to continue their battle against the settlers. Now, along with Dragging Canoe came one of his followers, a young man named Solly, originally from Kusawati Town. There he fought along dragging canoe, but eventually became renowned as a traditionalist prophet. In the first decade of the 19th century, the Shawnee leader Tecumseh took it upon himself to lead a multi-tribal assault on the white settlers flooding into Indian lands. Alongside Tecumseh was his younger brother, Tenskawata, who was widely known as a Shawnee prophet and whose teachings spread eventually to the tribes in the Southeast, including the Cherokee, where they influenced Sali. Tecumseh had asked the Cherokee to contribute men to the coming fight, and in response, the Cherokee National Council had sent a small delegation led by Major Ridge, known as The Ridge, to hear the Shawnee chief out at Tukabachi, a Muskegee village. When Tecumseh finished his message and asked for men to join the fight, the Ridge replied that if Tecumseh set one foot inside Cherokee territory, he would personally kill him. Wow. Now, Ridge considered Tecumseh a threat to Cherokee stability, especially since the tribe was then pursuing a policy of Americanizing or becoming more like their white neighbors with you know, plantations, slaves, and businesses, and things like that. Well, not long after the meeting at Tukabachi, the New Madrid earthquake struck. And many Cherokee took that tremendous earthquake as a sign that the Great Spirit was angered at the rejection of aid to Tecumseh. Weeks after the earthquake, Sali came to speak before the Cherokee Council. He eloquently urged the Cherokee to join with the Shawnee under Tecumseh and join them in war against the Americans. He pointed out that Tecumseh had come to the Chickamauga settlements in the 1780s and joined them in their fight against the whites, coming to Appalachia, and now it was time to repay the assistance. But the Ridge argued just as eloquently against sending warriors to help Tecumseh in his fight. This angered the supporters of Sali, who attacked the Ridge and who was saved when one of his friends intervened. This incident caused the council to decide in favor of the Ridge's position, declining to help the Shawnee. There's a legend that when this decision was made public, Sali prophesied that there would soon come an apocalypse for the Cherokee Nation and that the only safe place anywhere would be in the Smoky Mountains. Tecumseh was later defeated by General William Henry Harrison at the Battle of Tippecanoe. But it was during the 1830s that Sully truly made his mark in American and Appalachian history. And as I said, there are two different tales as to what happened. Now, the following version is taken from the Cherokee oral tradition. During the forced relocation of the Cherokee from Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, known as the Trail of Tears, many atrocities occurred 
caused by the U.S. military trying to forcibly remove people who didn't want to be removed from their homes. Solly and his wife and brother, along with his sons and their families, were taken by soldiers and marched at bayonet point toward the Indian agency that had been set up on the Hawassi River in southeast Tennessee, a holding place for the Cherokee to be held prior to transport out west. During this march, one of the babies in the group became fussy, and Solly's wife stopped to see what the child needed. At that point, one of the guards, becoming impatient, whipped her and then prodded her with his bayonet to get her to get moving again. Now, according to Solly's son, Wasnada, the wife and the baby were forced onto a horse, but in the process, she got her foot hung in the stirrup and slipped, causing the baby to fall. The child rolled out of control and busted its head and died almost instantly. Mm. And that incident sparked a rebellion. Well, an attack was made on the soldiers, resulting in the death of one of the guards and the rest either captured or wounded. Solly and his family fled into the mountains along the Tennessee-North Carolina border, where they eventually found a cave in the Smoky Mountains to hide in. Pretty soon, Solly's escape made the rounds to other Cherokee forced removal, inspiring them to do as he did. Soon, Cherokee, by the hundreds, joined Solly at his cave in the Smokies, where they lived off whatever they could find. Well, General Winfield Scott was in charge of the removal in the area, and General Scott was at a loss as to what to do about all the Cherokee who were running off to the rugged Smoky Mountains to hide out. He didn't have anywhere near a large enough force to march into the wilderness and forcibly bring the Indians out for removal, nor was he really sure exactly where Solly and his followers were located. But if Solly himself wasn't found and punished, then the entire removal would be for naught. After examining his options, he decided to seek the assistance of a unique individual, one we've talked about in a prior podcast. Mm -hmm. William Holland Thomas was a white attorney who'd been adopted into the tribe in his youth and would later gain fame during the Civil War when he led a company of Cherokee into battle on the side of the Confederacy as Thomas's Legion, whose story we've also told. Well, Scott contacted Thomas, who'd negotiated the removal for the tribe with the federal government, and asked him to get a message to Solly, telling the Cherokee leader that if he and his family would surrender to the military, the rest of the Cherokee in the mountains could remain free. Solly agreed to do this in order to protect the remnants of the Cherokee left in Appalachia. He and his sons and his brother came down from their stronghold and gave themselves up to the American military. They were immediately placed under arrest. The party, with the exception of Saleh's youngest son, Wasadana, were marched from a spot where they were executed by a firing squad of other Cherokee prisoners who were forced to kill Saleh and his group as a means of convincing the prisoners that any resistance was hopeless. Wow, what a way to kind of be, I don't know. Um, how can we say this, Steve, uh, you know, kind of a two face, uh, negotiation out of this, so to speak, I suppose, but you know, with this act of self-sacrifice, Solly managed to save those Cherokee who had managed to get into the wilderness along the border between North Carolina and Tennessee. And those fugitives, according to Cherokee oral tradition, became what's now known as the Eastern band of the Cherokee nation. And this version has been adopted into the outdoor drama Unto These Hills. Now, since that time, though, mm -hmm. records have been uncovered that paint a different picture, don't they, Rod? Yes, they have, Steve. On November 1st, 1838, American soldiers, along with William Thomas, found Solly and his group in the mountains where they had all gone to hide. While they were being marched to the camp, some of the Cherokee attacked the soldiers and they and Solly escaped. Akuna Lufta citizen Indians who were exempt from the removal and a few fugitive Cherokee offered to help recapture the men so long as they could be allowed to remain in North Carolina. Utasala, a neighbor of Sali, led 60 men in a search for the fugitive. On November 24th, Colonel William S. Foster, who had been ordered to find Sali, reported to General Scott that the mission was a success. He wrote that of 12 Indians who had escaped, all but Solly had been recaptured, that the three most responsible for the attack and escape had been punished, quote, by the Cherokee themselves in the presence of the 4th Regiment Infantry, end quote. And the next day, Atsala and another Cherokee found Solly and executed him. 
Utsala and his men were given permission to remain in North Carolina with the Oconolufti Indians, and eventually these groups would be recognized as the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. And Sully Boulevard, a major artery of traffic in Cherokee, North Carolina, is named in his honor. So there you go, Rod. You got two versions of this, one in which Sully was a definite hero Mm -hmm. and the Cherokee were abused, and the other where it sounds like the Cherokee joined in with the soldiers in order to get something for themselves, which was to be allowed to stay there. Yeah. So, and I mean, you know, one thing that really hit me back in this script when we were talking about it earlier, the Americanization of these Indians. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but you know, when you said the Americanization, I kind of start thinking back to my relative and also the head of the Cherokee at one time or another at Akula Kula, right. who was uh, one of those that uh, met with the British, met with the Americans and so forth. And, you know, even helped out the colonists, uh, even during their fight up until, you know, the, uh, the war for independence. But uh, that's part of that Americanization, if you want to call it that. It was uh, sort of a thing of, you know, becoming more like, guess you could say it, becoming more like the colonists themselves. The white man is what they were afraid of. Well, that's what they were attempting to do, or at least part of them were mm-hmm. attempting to do that right? Mm-hmm. with the plantations and the slaves and, and all of that just to try to fit in. But in the end, it didn't matter. Right. The folks that lived around them said an Indian is an Indian. Let's get them out of here. Mm-hmm. And that's the story, or rather the stories of Sully, Cherokee prophet. Another bit of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Now, you can subscribe to the audio version of the Stories podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Now, if video is your thing, well, you can watch Rod and me in all our glory telling our stories by clicking that subscribe button down below. Be sure to give us a like while you're at it, too, please. Till next we meet, so long, everybody. So long.